Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us for today's webinar, Employee Benefit Plans Industry Update. I'm Dan Sturm, Partner and Director of ERISA Services here at McConnelly and Asbury. With me today is Danielle Ginter, Zach Starner from our team. We're excited to also welcome a special guest on today's webinar, Renee Lear of Council of McNeese and member of their Employee Benefits and Executive Compensation Group. You'll hear from her in a little bit later in our presentation. Before we get started, I just want to mention, if you have any questions for us during the webinar, please submit them through the built-in questions function in the webinar control panel, and we'll do our best to answer them during or after the webinar. There will also be three polling questions throughout today's presentation, so be sure to answer those questions if you're looking to obtain CPE for today's webinar. For those of you that are not familiar with McConnelly and Asbury, we're a team of CPAs and business advisors serving clients from our offices in Camp Hill, Lancaster, and Bloomsburg. We provide a variety of services to industries, including the ones you see on our screen. We encourage you to visit our website and learn, learn more, and don't hesitate to get in touch with us for our service and industry experts to explore how we can partner together to best serve you and your organization. Objectives for today, uh, as shown on the screen here, learn how, learn how the new accounting updates impact plan sponsors. We're also going to talk through navigating in a COVID environment. We're to also hitting upon fiduciary responsibility considerations. Uh, we'll have a legal update from Renee at McNeese. And we also have some recent court cases that we want to run through. And that will take us to our first polling question. Why are you joining us today? Uh, first option, you need continuing educa education credits. Next, uh, you'll find our webinar, you find our webinars beneficial to sponsoring your plan. And lastly, you just love talking about employee benefit plans. And I know I, I know I have a couple of my clients on the phone that, especially uh, Carol out there, if you're on the line, I know you love talking about benefit plans. So you make sure you answer that question. All right, just a few more seconds here as we as these responses come in, see what these results come out to be. All right, about five more seconds and then we'll move on to our presentation. All right, there we go, time's up. All right, looks like not many people love talking about employee benefit plans. So I'll apologize. We got about 50 minutes to get through to talk about employee benefit plans. So we'll, we'll get your credits and hopefully you take a few beneficial things away today. So sit tight. We got a mix of topics. Hopefully uh, keep things moving here and get through the, the 50 minutes of the presentation. With that, I am going to switch it over to Danielle Ginter to talk about some new standards with employee benefit plans. Okay, great. Thanks, Dan. So the first one we want to talk about is a new auditing standard that's impacting employee benefit plans. SAS number 136 is effective for peri periods ending after December 15, 2021, so your 2021 calendar year ends. Originally, it was going to be effective for 2020, but like most things, it was deferred because of the pandemic. Early adoption is permitted, and there are new requirements for all stages of the audit. But before I start talking about those new requirements, I kind of wanted just to explain the why behind the standard. So the DOL did an audit quality assessment uh, a few years ago, and they tested a sample of 400 plans. And the result of that assessment was they found 39% of these audits to be deficient. So needless to say, uh, DOL was not very happy about it, and they went to the AICPA, and they were basically like, you guys need to help us with this. So this standard is in response to that. So the goal is to enhance the quality of the audits. So what impact does that have on the plan sponsor? So there'll be new acknowledgements in the engagement letter, um, mainly surrounding management's responsibility in maintaining a current plan document and amendments, uh, providing us a 5,500 before issuance. And then if you're choosing a limited scope audit to verify that the institution certifying those trust statements is qualified. And then at the end of the audit, you'll have a management representation letter that will mirror the same acknowledgements that you had in the engagement letter. 
Hey, Danielle, for, for, we have, I know we have a lot of clients on the call. Uh, would you expect much change in, in their experience from the past couple of years as a result of the new standard? I really wouldn't. When I read it, I was, I was pleasantly surprised that we were already doing the majority of what was already, um, that's what's highlighted in this standard. And I think probably a lot of auditors were as well. But again, I think they just wanted things that you should have already been doing in writing, if that makes sense. And then um, as far as the limited audit, scope audit election, it is still allowed. This standard does not change ERISA. However, it's now going to be called ERISA Section 103A 3C Audit. So it doesn't quite flow like limited scope. Um, and like I said, there are new, new procedures outlined in the SAS, but I, again, they were things that we were already doing and things that you would expect. Um, verifying that's a qualified institution, certifying the trust statements, obtaining the certification, and then verifying that the information in the trust statements is consistent with what's in the financial statements. What I would say is the biggest change of this whole thing is the audit report for these ERISA Section 103A 3C audits is going to look a lot different. I think right now the limited scope audit report is probably like a page and a quarter. Um, under this standard, it's going to be over three pages long. However, I actually really like this change because I feel like if you have a new user of the financial statements, it can be kind of confusing when they see disclaimer of opinion, trying to decipher what we actually did. And that's not going to be an issue with this three page audit report. It's very clear what the auditor did over the information that was certified by the trustee and what was not what we did over what was not certified. And then I think that leads us to polling question number two. Have you modified your processes as they relate to your employee benefit plans due to remote working arrangements? Yes, no, or not sure. And I, I would be thinking that a lot of this will probably be yes, but we'll give it a few more seconds. I know my working arrangement looks a lot different now with since COVID. Okay. Just a couple more seconds. No, I think um, in, in these next few slides as well, it's a, it's a good lead in as we, we get through uh, this polling question, we're gonna talk about some tips, some things we've already seen Quite honestly, there's probably going to be some uh, best practices we see over the next several months that we haven't even thought about yet. Uh, as more more of our clients are working remotely and departments are scattered, that normally would work together, especially on a plan. And uh, yeah, it looks like uh, results are in. Uh, we have most processes haven't changed too much, and it's like a, about a third aren't sure as well. So no, it's it's good to know. It's good to it's good to be thinking about those. Um, I know we're we're past the audits uh, for for the ten fifteen deadline, uh, but as you start thinking about heading into to your audits for for next year, it's good to just kind of think back and say what processes may have changed that that your auditor is going to come in and ask about. So it's good to think about it from that perspective. And if you haven't really sat down to think about it globally beyond the audit. Uh, definitely good to sit down and think about what changes may have occurred where things may possibly get missed in this new environment. So with that, I'm going to start the uh, slides uh, with working in a remote environment. We can flip to the next slide. I, I think point number one up here, and we have about three slides of, of tips, and it, it's not necessarily a remote environment. I would say probably a COVID environment as well. But first thing is just making sure you're still having your regular meetings uh, with key team members. As I just talked about, might not be too many opportunities to sit in a room all together anymore, like we, we may have a few months ago, um, but just making sure those meetings are still happening. Uh, those of you familiar with the, the plans that are on this call, the plans work best when you kind of have all parties involved, and, and that's finance, HR, uh, members of management that are making decisions on the plan. It's, it would be good if you haven't done so already to kind of sit down and figure out what may have changed uh, with your processes and what do you need to adjust for. Reality is there's still a lot of data being transferred. Uh, maybe there is no changes, um, but at least sit down and think about it. I know 
for us and some other clients, there, there's definitely an impact. There's things where paper might have moved across desks, so now it's electronic. How are we handling those processes? I would also make sure you understand all your service providers. So just think about all your service providers that serve your plan. You have your TPA, you have your, your accountants, you have investment custodians. Um, so you, you have service providers that are providing a lot of different things to the plan, making sure you understand what their environment looks like and how, how, you, how they're working remotely and how things might have changed their process. Maybe you only talk to them a couple times a year, but it'd be good to get in touch. That way you, you don't have any surprises come here in a few months to learn they're doing something a little bit different. Uh, just to make sure you understand their process as well as yours. Next one is um, an interesting point, and I, I'm going to ask uh, Renato to weigh in on this a little bit as well. Especially in the early days of COVID, I'm thinking like March and April. Um, if if you've dealt with us through an audit, we always ask about the timeliness of contributions and, and late remittances and things like that. And I would assume we're probably going to have more clients and more folks asking questions about, hey, I was late for a couple pays in March because we were trying to move all of our computers, we're trying to move payroll offsite and still try to get everything done. Maybe a contribution that normally takes us two to three days, now it took 10 plus days, is that late? And I, based on conversations I've had, I, there's not a formal exception at this point, um, but I would have to believe there's some level of of leeway with getting contributions and a little bit later during that time. I think the best recommendation I have at this point is at least make sure you've identified those. And if you do have any that might be late under your normal calculations, make sure you're documenting that you really did everything you possibly could. And I think file that away and just retain it for your records. I don't know that there's a... a a big need to go rush and correct it at this point, because I, I do think there will be a little bit of leeway, like I said, but just be cognizant of those. And, and Renee, I don't know if you have anything to add to that from a legal perspective. Right, and, and you and I have actually discussed this in the past. Um, there is nothing official out there right now that gives um, like carte blanche it's okay to be late with your with your contributions, but um, there is essentially there there is guidance out there where um, the DOL has taken the position that you know they understand it's a COVID environment, and so um, they will give a little leeway to employers in complying with the the rules under uh, ERISA and the and the Treasury agrees under the IRS. Um, that being said, as you know, we've talked. Um, Dan, about this is that even though there's a safe harbor um, under the regs on when you actually have to make the contributions, the DOL looks to see how what your pattern was in the past. Like if your pattern is normally two days and suddenly it's five, then the DOL is going to say, okay, that might fall in the safe harbor. We want to know why you're off, why it's five days on on that one incident incidents when it's two in the past. And I think that you'll get, you know, you'll probably have a little cushion because it was COVID and it was, you know, the country shut down. Um, that being said, we're about to go into our second, third, who knows, <laughs> um, little spike in COVID here. And it seems that companies are starting to shut down again. But I think that if you're late on your on your contributions this time around, um, you'll have less sympathy from the DOL because we, you know, we've been through this before. Um, everyone knows that um, COVID, that you know the dark winter is coming, and um, I believe the DOL will take the position that you should have prepared. Yep, and I agree entirely. I think that's the approach we'll take, especially as we, we get to this point next year and start evaluating this from an audit perspective. Uh, with that, next, um, changes in record retention. As I talked about at the beginning of this slide, I, it, we still see a lot of manual approvals for certain things in, in some control environments where you see manual signatures on documents. So again, just be w aware of those that may not have happened uh, in this remote environment. And if you're if you become aware of something that hasn't happened from a control perspective, just consider new tools. Um, I know I'm seeing DocuSign a ton more uh, provides a good trail, and there's other products out there as well that that can kind of supplement a, a manual process uh, when you're once all sitting in an office together. 
Next, um, on the next slide, I would say make sure you're you're very aware of your your definition of uh, plan compensation and eligibility. And it, we saw a lot of crazy things with compensation and potential layoffs and, and changes in compensation, salary, and things like that. Whether it's severance, I, furloughs, you name it, we saw it all at the beginning of, of COVID. Just because the companies had no idea what was happening next, we had the PPP program, so all kinds of things were going on. So if you had anything unique in your organization with pay and compensation, I would make sure you think back to what you changed or what you may have changed and how that translates into the 401k plan. Because obviously the 401k plan has a unique definition of plan compensation. It's defined in your plan document. So you're gonna to wanna to be crystal clear if anything you did early on in COVID or throughout COVID actually impacted that. And so, as I mentioned, impact the layoffs, any partial plan termination. So if you're an organization that, act, that did lay some, some folks off and it turns out to be a significant percentage of, of your personnel, make sure you're talking to your attorneys or, or reaching out to Renee to just make sure you didn't hit that criteria for a partial plan termination. That could be a whole presentation in and of itself, but just something to think about if you did have significant layoffs and the impact on your plan. And, I would and, make sure you go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I, I was just going to chime in. I apologize. Go ahead, finish. Yeah, go for it. Um, what I was going to say is, uh, at the beginning of COVID, um, we had a lot of clients calling us, and I expect that this is going to happen again. Um, as Dan said, uh, when you when you lay off, it depends upon how you mark these employees on whether or not it's going to to cause a partial plan termination. And we had a lot of large service providers telling employers who were um, lay, who were shut down by the state who were laying off their employees with the with the idea that they were going to bring them back as soon as they were opened back up. Um, we had a lot of service providers telling those clients that you know you're terminated your employee because the employee is now on uh, unemployment and so you have a um, plan you know partial plan termination and all of those employees are now 100% vested and you need to make additional contributions. Um, uh, to 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 fix this and you and you actually have to pay them out um under you know the under the 401k to give them the rollover notice and it all depends upon how you actually classify those employees i mean if you classify as a termination maybe but if it's a layoff then not necessarily but you would have to look at the way that you do that yeah perfect thank yeah. you Renee. no I, I agree and it's, it's a complicated issue the partial plan terminations when we see those come up uh, unfortunately we haven't seen them too often um, i would say nine out of ten times we're we're suggesting our, our clients or whoever's reached out to us to talk to an attorney because they can get tricky and there might be opportunities for a benefit to the sponsor not to call it a, a partial plan termination uh, next i i make sure you're reviewing all the reports from your record keepers again you, you may have in the past got things in the mail you may have got your distribution reports at the end of a month end of a quarter uh, same with loans and changes to contributions now with that coming over electronically maybe with a link in an email i would just I, I just think it's a good practice to make sure you're reviewing those reports even if your controls on the front end didn't catch something that might have snuck through the plan that shouldn't have things happen uh, we see it all the time Reviewing those reports, you can catch things a little bit quicker instead of waiting a year from now for the audit. I, next, I would say continue to meet with your investment advisors. I mean, the, the market, as we've all seen, went to, to crazy low levels back in March. It's a, I don't know what it's at today, but I mean, it, it's it spiked way back up. But I mean, I think it's a good opportunity. If you haven't met with your advisors, to make sure you're meeting with your advisors to make sure you have the right mix of investments for your participants. Here, turning to the next slide, uh, for those of you that have safe harbor contributions, if there, if you do have safe harbor contributions, I don't see a ton of these, but I do see enough. And I did see some of those get suspended um, early on in March and April. Uh, so just be aware of any impact and any communications that are required if you did suspend or freeze any of those contributions. So again, I don't see a ton of it, uh, but just something to be aware of if you did freeze any of those to make sure you understand the communication. Understand CARES Act provisions, and we're, we have a couple slides on CARES Act coming up here shortly, so I won't get into that. Uh, but obviously a big impact on 2020 to make sure you understand those provisions as it impacts your plan. 
the last point here I think is probably one of the biggest is uh, just we've talked about it for years now data security internally and externally I think it's it's more important now than ever I mean it, it, with these plans we've talked about there's a, a tremendous amount of personal information that goes back and forth to, ser to probably all your service providers as it relates to the plan so you want to make sure you're protecting that data and doing everything you can to make sure that data is secured so, especially social security numbers I, everything's in there with these plans for all your participants so I'd be hesitant to, I just wouldn't do it send any make sure you're not sending any files to your service providers just in, in a file over email uh, they should all be asking you for information through a portal if they're not I would question that service provider I hate to say it but I mean it's just that they should not be sending or receiving data unprotected at this point uh, in time especially working remotely when we can't be sure of all the the security we would normally have in an office. So understand how it's being transmitted. Is it encrypted email? Is it portal? Uh, what are the service providers for working remote? So just like a lot of our, our, our clients, a lot of the service providers are working remote as well. What does their security look like? Uh, do they have any documentation, maybe in a SOC report, that covers some kind of remote access to their system? So just questions you should consider uh, just as, as sponsors the plans. And with that, I'm going to switch to the, the next polling question, uh, which will lead us directly into our next topic. Uh, who is a planned fiduciary? And the options are a planned sponsor, a planned administrator, an investment advisor, or all the above. And take about a minute here to get those results in. And as we talk through this, <clears throat> or as you're answering the, the, this polling question, I mean, I. As we talked about putting this presentation together, I feel like the past probably few presentations, we've talked about what is a plan fiduciary and what do they do and things like that. And it's just one of those topics, and I even talked to Renee about it before this presentation started. It's just always relevant. I think it's always a good reminder to understand what your role is in the plan. Are you a fiduciary? And what kind of limitations does that, that bring to your role? What kind of liability exposure does that bring as a fiduciary? So it's just things you should be aware of and make sure you understand that I would be willing to bet most of the people that have dialed into this call are probably a planned fiduciary in some respect and so probably have some legal obligation to serve the plan. So it's just good to understand that role. And I think there's some other things that just benefit us from, from repeating this topic. With that being said, a few more seconds and there's our results. Uh, looks like all the above. And with that, I will turn it over to uh, Zach to start talking about um, some matters on planned fiduciary. Thanks, Dan. <clears throat> so it looks like, uh, based off of those results, 78% of the people here today um, recognize that um, all of those options were uh, planned fiduciaries. So what is a, what, what is a planned fiduciary? Um, it's someone that exercises authority or control over the management of plan assets. Um, someone that would render investment advice to the plan for a fee, have discretional authority or responsibility in plan management. It could be an individual that's specifically named in the plan document, or even individuals that could be fiduciaries based, just based on their um, daily functions and how they interact with the plan. Um, so here are some some more definitive examples. Some of these options uh, should look a little familiar. Um, a plan sponsor, they would be a plan fiduciary, plan management, uh, benefit committee members, the plan trustee, investment and investment advisors. Sorry about that, I got a little carried away with the slides. So what are the res responsibilities of, of a plan fiduciary? Um, well, they're to act solely in the interest of the plan participants um, with the exclusive purpose of providing benefits to them. So that's not benefits to the company, that's not benefits uh, to the plan administrator. Uh, personally, that would be um, benefits to all plan participants. They're to use plan access, plan act assets exclusively for the purpose of paying plan benefits 
and reasonable um, expenses of administering the plan. They're to carry out duties with care, skill, prudence, and diligence. Diversifying plan investments to uh, minimize um, large losses and also control the expenses associated with those investments. And they're to follow the um, terms outlined in the plan document. And lastly, here's a couple uh, responsibilities examples. So meeting the applicable reporting requirements, reporting and disclosure requirements. Um, some examples of that would be your Form 5500 filings, um, summary plan descriptions, fee disclosures, uh, blackout notices, and various plan amendments. Um, prudently selecting and monitoring uh, plan service providers, plan services, and investment options. Um, I think I think that's key too. You know, uh, how many times when we come out for our audits do we ask to see board meeting minutes because we want to see um, you know the benefit plan committee discussing uh, invest different investment options, um, trying to understand why maybe we moved from one class of funds to the other, um, and, and all of that is just trying to ascertain uh, you know. Is, is the plan sponsor considering um, you know, the fees and the returns on, on these investments as they make their decisions. Uh, time, timely remittance of participant contributions, uh, meeting the fidelity bonding requirements, meeting the non-discrimination testing requirements, and also following up and making any required corrections, and then avoiding any prohibited transactions um, basically acting adversely to the plan participants. At this point in time, I'll turn it over to Danielle to discuss the financial impact to the plan sponsors. Thanks, Zach. So why is it important to heed Zach's advice? Um, well, quite frankly, it can be expensive to make an error in a benefit plan. Um, some examples are one thing that we'll see a lot is maybe a participant missed a deferral opportunity. If that's not caught, caught timely, a plan sponsor could have to remit 50% of the missed deferrals to the participant's account. Um, we, he talked a little bit about timely contributions to the plan. If it's found that you don't have a timely remittance, you would be required to remit to the plan missed earnings that the participants lost out on. Um, and then say you have a complex correction that needs to be made, then you have the cost of getting service providers involved to help you. But by far the most significant expense is if you have a 5500 that say you didn't you didn't file um, maybe you did you weren't it's a health and welfare plan and you weren't aware that you required a filing or maybe you got an audit and the Department of Labor came in and said that that audit was a bad audit or a deficient audit you can be fined up to two hundred and fifty dollars a day up to hundred and fifty thousand dollars by the IRS and that's just the IRS the Department of Labor can also fine you two thousand two thousand three hundred and thirty dollars a day so that's why all of these are really important uh, if we go to the next slide though all is not lost there are ways if you make a mistake which is which is going to happen all of us make errors the IRS has a great resource on their website. It's the IRS Fix-It Guide. And essentially what it does is it gives examples of common plan errors, how to correct it, and then also how to prevent it from happening in the future. So I, I really recommend people use that as a resource. And part of their correction is, um, options that they give is part of this employee plans compliance resolution system. So the first part of this is the self-correction program. So there's no requirement to notify the IRS. This is mainly used for operational failures. And the good news is in 2019, they expanded this program. Uh, so it now includes um, being able to fix things like loans before you weren't able to fix um, most loan issues through the self-correction program. You would have had to go through the voluntary correction program. And the voluntary correction program is a great option too. The big difference there is that would be for some of your more significant operational failures, like maybe something that impacted all of your participants and usually plan document failures. And essentially what you do with this is you inform the IRS that you made this error, you pay user fee, and then you'll get a letter back from the IRS that notes that they approved your correction. 
Now, the last one, the, really the only thing I want to say about the audit closing agreement program is you don't want to get to that point because if you're going through the audit cap, that basically means you went through an IRS audit and they found something. So it's much better if you can find these errors on your own and correct them prior to even getting to this point. Yeah, and Daniel, I would probably say the most common error we see, and we've talked about it a little bit in the beginning of the presentation, is the late remittances. I mean, we, we see that fairly often uh, throughout our audits, throughout the entire season. And I, I'll, I'll say and I'll reiterate, the correction from a dollar perspective of those late remittance, I can't tell you the last time I saw one that was very, like a significant dollar amount. It's more just yeah. the, the headache and process to figure out what that dollar amount is. Oftentimes it's, it's pennies on the dollar to a participant to correct their account. Reality is you still have to do it. Um, and it's much easier to correct it voluntarily than to have the IRS come in and find those same errors. But again, it's it's gonna be probably pennies on the dollar in most cases if you're a couple of weeks late on a contribution. Um, but it is quite honestly, a, it's a big administrative burden to go back and figure out what that correction should be. Right. And Dan and, and Danielle, this is Renee. Um, the one that I'm seeing a lot um, this year is, and Dan, you mentioned this earlier, is the definition of compensation, where employers, um, recently realized that the they thought compensation was defined one way and after maybe many years of um treating compensation as being defined that way someone has picked up on that that the issue that compensation is actually defined differently in their plan. For example, like bonuses are maybe excluded in the plan, but they've been um, allowing employees to contribute on bonuses. That's right, a great see. point, and that's probably a very close second to the late remittances because you just, it, it's been calculated a certain way for the last 10 plus years. The the sponsor's perspective is, is the, the TPA or the, whoever their service provider has calculated that based on a, a plan document. Well, a plan document may have been updated and it just didn't make it over to the service provider. So there you have it, like, bon like you said, bonuses are excluded and they shouldn't be. And now you have a big mess on your hands of trying to figure out how do we go back and correct that? Can we retroactively correct that? Is that even possible? Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's one of those things, make sure you understand the definition of plan compensation and those late remittances, just develop a process during the year. Uh, I know there's a few on the line, we, we've talked about good processes and things like that of just avoiding it. Um, th that's the best case scenario, just don't be late, um, almost in un any circumstances and you'll be better off for it. No, I, I agree. And the other thing with plan compensation is we usually see that error too, if you've had payroll providers that have switched and something just wasn't flagged correctly in the system. So um, if you do switch payroll providers, just make sure that you're double checking after that first payroll run that your plan compensation was set up correctly. And then I think Dan is going to talk about the CARES Act next. Yeah, so just briefly, I think, I would expect most have heard uh, about some of the changes with CARES Act. So we just want to highlight a couple of those uh, for 2020. Uh, but obviously with CARES Act, there was a direct impact on 401k audits, and, or not 401k audits, but 401k plans, uh, benefit plans. Uh, and that's really with distributions and loans. That's the, the biggest impact, at least from our perspective. There's a lot else in the CARES Act, but from a 401k plan perspective, you have now you're allowed distributions during a certain period of time up to i believe the number is a hundred thousand dollars which is on the slide uh, the big benefit from a cares act perspective is you can take an early distribution from your 401k plan or your participants can and it was not subject to that 10 percent penalty that a normally normal early distributions would have been subjected to uh, there's a couple criteria you have had to have been diagnosed with uh, covid uh, or a spouse or dependent uh, would qualify as well, and also experiencing adverse financial consequences. So one of those criteria would likely allow you to take that distribution. I believe most plans that I've talked to have allowed that. I don't know how many people have taken advantage of that, uh, but it's out there. So just make sure you understand it as part of your plan. Make sure your documentation is in place, any amendments that need to be filed make sure they get filed so your plan supports that. But again, those are out there. I, I, I believe most of, of the clients that I spoke to uh, did take advantage of that and did allow that just in case they had participants that needed it. 
uh, with the distributions, you can either pay the tax up front as an individual, you can pay it over a three-year period, and if you decide to pay the distribution back to your 401k plan, you won't be taxed on it. So if you if you get to year three and you decide to pay it all back, then you'll get to recoup the tax you've paid in those first two years back. Also is loans on the next slide, so changes with loans under CARES Act. Uh, prior to CARES Act, the, the max loan amount was $50,000. It is now $100,000 under the CARES Act. Uh, let's see, and also there's payment relief for existing loans. So if your participants had an existing loan, they can defer payments on those loans if they chose to. Uh, again, I saw these both as options uh, at several plans and I know they were being implemented. So something just to be aware of is, as you get to your ending, you're evaluating those loans and maybe people are starting to pay again, make sure your processes are picking those up to make sure everything got captured correctly. And with that, and I know I went a couple minutes over, so I cut into to Renee's time. I'm going to switch it over to Renee, to Renee to talk through some court cases that are definitely very um, beneficial to hear about and understand where, where things are at in the legal world. So thank you, Dan. Um, the, the first one is good news for those of you out there who have defined benefit plans. And as, as you know, a defined benefit plan is a plan where um, the participants receive a set amount of money each month, regardless of the amount of plan assets um, that are actually in the plan, as opposed to a defined contribution plan, which is like a 401k where the participants actually get um, an amount based upon what is in their account, their account balance. So Mr. Thole and Ms. Smith worked for U.S. Bank and they retired and they were participants under the defined benefit retirement plan. Um, Mr. Thole received um, $2,198.38 a month and Ms. Smith received $42.26. Yes, $42 a month. And they received this, this, these payments month after month without fail. Um, however, um, during the financial crisis, U.S. Bank, um, who was the plan fiduciary, um, the plan actually lost $1.1 billion in, in plan assets. And so Mr. Thole and, you know, Ms. Smith, because she wants to protect your $42, sold, um, sold sued U.S. Bank um, for $750 million. Um, what was interesting, the court also noted that um, it was a $750 million lawsuit and they wanted attorney's fees of $31 million. Um, next slide, please. Um, but essentially what the court said was that, okay, you know, we get it. Um, U.S. Bank may have lost $1.1 billion in the plan, but Mr. Tholen and Ms. Smith get the same amount of money regardless of the amount of money that's in the plan, and they haven't missed the payment yet to, to the participants, so they didn't have standing. You know, the court said that, you know, win or lose, these two individuals would receive the exact same amount of money, so there's no reason for the court to decide whether or not U.S. Bank breached their fiduciary duty, and, and, and the case was dismissed. So the next slide, please. So the next case is an interesting case for those of you who have ESOPs out there. Um, in, Mr. Jander was an IBM employee, and IBM, as you know, is a publicly traded company, and uh, IBM's ESOP committee consisted of a lot of the top executives at IBM. So they would have confidential, um, non-public information regarding IBM's business. And these committee members actually knew that IBM had um, this microelectronics business that they were planning on selling. And then once that was actually um, sold and closed, that IBM would have to take a $700 million loss um, on their financial statements because of this business. And, but during this time period that these executives knew that this loss was coming, um, they continue to allow the ESOP to buy shares. So once this million, $70 million loss was actually announced, um, IBM's shares sank, they tanked, and Mr. D Jander sued. Next slide, please. So he goes to the district court, Southern District of New York, and um, you know, IBM's like, hey, look, we couldn't have told you 
that we were going to take this loss um, because that's insider information and there's security laws that prevent us from providing information and selling shares and, and stopping to um, purchasing shares based upon insider information. So we could not have told or, or changed the way that we were conducting the ESOP based upon this information. And if we did, then these executives, the committee would have um, broken securities laws. So the, the district court said, you know, you're right, um, case dismissed. But then it went to the Second Circuit. And the Second Circuit said, um, no, there's a standard that we have. And um, Mr. Jander is saying that it, you should have disclosed this to the public earlier so you could have stopped purchasing the shares earlier. And um, because of that, then he does have a claim against you guys and he should have his day in court. So then it goes to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court says, you know what? Yeah, we're just going to remand the case back to the second because and we're not even going to talk about what the Second Circuit said. What we're going to talk about is like, is there a duty under ERISA to actually disclose confidential information? And of course, it goes back to the Second Circuit and the Second Circuit said, we've already looked at that. We decided we're not going to talk about this. So we're still remanding back to the district court for Mr. Jander to have his day in court. And so right now, Mr. Jander is fighting the Southern District of New York against the committee of IBM saying that, you know, they breached their fiduciary duty because they didn't disclose what is essentially insider information. Um, we don't know how this is going to end up, but it's definitely one to watch. Next slide, please. So Mr. Salima um, was an, um, an interesting employee at Intel. Um, he worked for Intel from 2010 to 2012, um, a little less than two years. And he participated in two different retirement plans at Intel. And while he was there, Intel, as a participant in the retirement plan, um, would provide him emails that said, you know, the disclosures are now online and, and net benefits. Go see the disclosure. And they did this for several of the notices that went out. Um, Mr. Solima actually went on to the net benefits account that he had. And he, during this less than two year period, he actually accessed it more than 68 times and hit a thousand or more than a thousand different pages of information. But in doing so, um, he says that he didn't notice that what the, the investments in his, in his retirement plan were actually invested in. So what ended up happening is, you know, 2010 to 2012, that's right after the financial crisis. And in 2008, what Intel's investment policy committee did was they started to invest in alternate investments, such as private equity and in um, commodities and hedge funds. So when the market turned around, the investment return for this retirement plan that Mr. Solima was in was not as good as the general market. And so he sued. And what Intel said was, no, wait a minute. You know, in you worked in 2010 to 2012, you're suing in 2015. ERISA has a requirement that if that you have to file suit within three years of gaining the knowledge of what you're claiming the breach of fiduciary duty was. And so you've missed your statute of limitation because you had actual knowledge. You access net benefits. You saw what um, we were investing in. Um, next slide, please. What the Supreme Court actually said was, you know, in the lawsuit, Mr. Solima said, you know, yeah, I might have hit it 68 times or going on 68 times. And I may have hit like over a thousand different pages. I just don't remember reading anything about what, what the funds were invested in. I don't recall. I don't think I did. I don't think I saw that. So because he said that he didn't recall <clears throat> actually reading the disclosures about the investment funds, he, the Supreme Court said that, yeah, he gets to have his day in court because that's not actual knowledge, that they would have to prove that he actually read it or that he um, read part of the page and did something and 
um, as a result of reading part of the information and they hadn't. So he gets his day in court as well. Next slide, please. So this one is um, a case that the Supreme Court decided not to um, not to decide. And why is that important? That's important because right now <clears throat> the circuits are split. When a plaintiff says that you know I've I've you've breached a fiduciary duty and I have a loss, for example, in, in Mr. Solomon's case, um, some of the courts say that it's the plaintiff who actually has to show that the losses were a result of the breach of fiduciary duty and not necessarily just the loss, you know, that everyone in all plans would have had a similar loss. Whereas there's other cases that say that it's the defendant who has to prove that the loss didn't result from their breach. So if there's a loss in Intel's um, retirement plans, it would be Intel who has to show that that wasn't caused by their breach, as opposed to Mr. Solimas arguing that it was caused by the breach. It's still a toss up. Third Circuit hasn't weighed in, so who knows what would happen in our jurisdiction. And the last case is, this is very important, and this goes back to what Dan mentioned earlier. Um, it is very important that um, you have um, um, data protection policies in place. What happened in Leventhal, Leventhal is um, an attorney, and Leventhal had a law firm in the Eastern District, and they had a 401k profit sharing plan. And what happened was they had, Leventhal had um, contracted with Manned Marble Stone to, to be their plan administrator to design, administer, and consult on their plan. And Nationwide was the custodian of funds. Mr. Leventhal um, sent an email from his work email to um, Nationwide and attached a form withdrawing approximately $15,000 from his 401k. Meanwhile, this law firm had an employee who was working remotely from Texas and who was using her personal email to conduct firm businesses and was emailing back and forth to her business email address. And somehow um, the server, the Leventhal law firm server was hacked and no one knew it. But what they, the hackers, the criminals did do was they saw the remittance form from Mr. Leventhal to Nationwide, copied it, changed the numbers and essentially used his email to wipe out $400,000 out of his 401k plan. So of course the attorney um, in the law firm sued um, the plan administrator and Nationwide and, and sued Nationwide for actually, um, be, because the, the law firm essentially said that it was it should have made um, the um, contact him that it was very unusual for him to have a sequence of several several withdrawals that would actually drain his account to zero and neither party actually contacted him to double check that you know that they they should not have they breached their fiduciary duty in, in, in giving out this money and what um, nationwide and man marble stone said was hey, you know what, plan sponsor, attorney who's the partner in the law firm who has this employee who was using her personal email and remote working that caused the data breach, that caused your personal information to be stolen from your law firm and that caused all of this, this um, you know, the $400,000 from leaving your account, we're county counter suing you to be liable with us for that loss. And the Eastern District said, you can do that. So the bottom line is, it was an employee of the law firm who used her personal email in her remote work situation that caused the server to get hacked. Um, and that even though Nationwide and the plan administrator saw that there was unusual activity and didn't say anything about it, the court said that, yes, it's possible that all of you, that the law firm for not having policies to stop the employee from using her personal email and, the, and nationwide and the plan administrator, you all could be liable on this so that you can fight it out amongst yourself. Next slide. 
This summer, the DOL um, uh, um, finalized its rules, as you know, in the past for retirement plans. Um, you could actually furnish notices um, to anyone who was wired at work, anyone sitting at the computer, and anyone who opted into receiving electronic notices. What this does now, the final rule does, is like reverses it. So you can furnish uh, electronic, you can furnish notices by electronic delivery to anyone with for whom you have a valid email address. And then the person has to opt out of receiving it. But obviously, before you do that, there are certain things that you have to follow. You need to verify their email. You need to provide them a notice. But it, this should make it easier for everyone to disseminate um, retirement plan notices. Next slide. The IRS, and the link is here, um, has updated their rollover notice that um, you should provide it to your employees um, if they're eligible for a, um, a rollover distribution. And all of this does is includes um, the, the additional language for if your plan adopted the birth or adoption distributions that you're now allowed to do under the SECURE Act, um, not having a required minimum distribution in 2020 and the COVID distributions. Next slide. So also with the SECURE Act, um, the, uh, the Congress, Congress had implemented um, the 401k lifetime um, income illustrations to where at least once every 12 months, you have to provide two separate illustrations on what the participants benefit statement um, benefit statements would be. And essentially what you're doing on your benefit statement is you're providing a um, the equivalent of a lifetime annuity and the equivalent of a joint survivor annuity um, for the participant to, to kind of like conceptualize the the amount of cash that they have what this could be if it was an annuity in the future next slide the, and the next slide is essentially just an example that was taken from the dol of what this illustration should be and I know a lot of you are out there thinking, oh, my gosh, you know, what if the numbers are wrong? We're going to get sued. Well, the DO, um, the DOL actually indicated that if you use the assumptions that are prescribed in the regulations, that that will provide you um, that you will be it's a defense to actually being sued, that that it's protection against um, lawsuits. And lastly. The. IRS came out with the 2021 adjusted for 15 limitations. And the one of note is just that your elective deferrals remain unchanged at 19.5 and the rest you could read um, at your convenience. And with that, I will turn it over to Dan. Actually gonna turn that right back over to, to Zach, but I mean, I appreciate all the, the cases. Um, Renee, I think it's just, high, while these are some big organizations, I think it just proves time and time again each year these cases come up. Um, so participants are out there, they're looking, uh, and these things do happen at it, companies of all sizes. So just something to be aware of, take it, especially like the, the cyber stuff stands out to me the most. I, I just see more and more of that happening. We're hearing about that. So just make sure you have the right policies and controls in place. With that, I'll let Zach kick it over. Uh, we have a few more cases here. That we have i think it, we'll go through one or two well the rest will be out there for the recap of the presentation we won't go through them all but things that are relevant nonetheless to several of the topics we talked about today uh thank you dan so here's a case that involves a company called uh sin city investment group um so <clears throat> what happened here is the president and the company were fiduciaries to the plan and they were deducting employee contributions from the employee's paycheck but they were failing to forward those contributions onto the plan. Now, obviously this would kind of fall into the uh, fiduciary responsibility um, that we talked about earlier um, of timely contributions. So this went to the US District Court and the District Court ordered the president of the company to restore the $41,000 of uh, missing contributions that were owed to non-fiduciary employees. Um, he, they had to pay, the company had to pay an additional $10,000 of lost opportunity costs associated with the untimely um, 
contributions. And this is just because those contributions are not entering the plan on a timely basis. So then those um, participants are missing out on the opportunity to um, earn their 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 earnings on, on their contributions. And then the president of the company um, was actually barred from serving as a um, plan fiduciary on any other retirement plan. So that's an interesting perspective there. Um, as the president of the co the company, you would you would be held um, as a plan fiduciary, and this individual, due to um, some of the practices that that they had at the company, um, he, he he can no longer serve as a, a plan fiduciary uh, anymore. Yeah, and I think this case and cases like it highlight the fact why the DOL is so much, why this is probably hot topic number one, because there are companies out there that are using participant contributions and delaying contributions into the plan for, for company cash flow purposes, which is fraud. Um, so that's why it is probably hot topic number one. It does happen. We probably have about time for about one more, Zach, and then uh, wrap it. we can wrap it up. Yeah, so here, here's another one with uh, Had Cell Chemical. Um, again, you'll you'll see it's a very similar case to um, the case study we just talked about. Um, the CEO of the company was w withholding uh, voluntary contributions from the employees, um, but he he again failed to remit those funds to um, the third party service provider in a timely manner, um, and these funds were actually held. Um, in the plan sponsor's general operating account. So they were not held by the benefit plan itself in some sort of cash account. Um, they were actually held by the plan sponsor. Again, this went the whole way up to the U.S. District Court. Um, the District Court said that the company was responsible for paying the $53,000 of untimely remittances um, back to the employees. $12,000 of additional lost opportunity um, costs associated with the untimely contributions. And they also barred this individual from acting as a plan fiduciary as well. And I think this, this just kind of highlights how important it is um, to try to remit those employee contributions timely and, and get those funds from the payroll system to the custodian or third party service provider. And there's one other thing I wanted to, to discuss um, real quick. I found this interesting as well. Um, so <clears throat> there was a um, breach of fiduciary responsibility related to the International Union of Operating Engineers um, and this came about because the plan summary plan de description was found to be legally deficient. Um, and what the court defined as legally deficient is it was an unreasonable length of 156 pages. It was not um, organized in a logical manner. It had opaque language um, and misused or inconsistently used um the the terms that were defined in the summary plan description and i think this is this stu stood out to me because i i feel like sometimes uh plan documents plan amendments summary summary plan descriptions you know those documents are produced you know maybe back in 2010 years ago and they're kind of put away on the shelf um but they still hold value today and in, and in this case um, I think what happened here is um, there were some terms and stuff in the summary plan description that were not clear and it impacted uh, distributions. And when the two individuals bought suit against the International Union of, of Engineers, the courts found uh, the summary plan description to be deficient. Yeah, thank you, Zach. I appreciate that. And on behalf of McConley and Asbury, we thank you for joining us for this webinar. If you have any further questions regarding today's presentation, please feel free to reach out to one of us and we'd be happy to help. A recap of today's presentation will be posted on our website in a few days. And for those of you who need CPE, these certificates will be sent out 
within the next two weeks. Thanks again for joining us and have a great rest of your week.